three of you are watching on C-SPAN. It's coming today's speech, so we are very I'm glad that uh, people all across the country and the world will be able to see this. I'm Steve Rutherford, I'm Dean of the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service, and welcome to another in our series of public programs, distinguished lectures, and community conversations. Under the leadership of Patrick Kennedy and Nikolai the Pippa, we've had over 100 speakers and guests this semester in the school year. Uh, and this program has emerged into Harvard-like quality in a very short time. Much of that work and tribute is due to the work of Patrick and Nikolai. Uh, in addition, uh, through our research center, hundreds of thousands of people all across the globe are able to access uh, the remarks and the DVDs of these speakers so that uh, these students, the journalists, and others uh, can also take advantage of these programs. Um, as John DePetro mentioned to me just a minute ago, uh, these speaker series, these guest lectures, <coughs> do represent public service, and that is what a public institution of public service should be doing. And so we're glad you're able to join us today to take part in this free series that many people uh, uh, have enjoyed and experienced. And as you all know, tonight Richard Dawkins is speaking at the State House Convention Center. Uh, we're going to have a, a program on Global Warming Saturday here, and uh, you have a list of the upcoming speakers, and I believe the May list uh, on, your, on your table. To, uh, to introduce um, our distinguished guest today uh, is my good friend, whom I have the great pleasure of working with. You need to know, in addition to being the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and a distinguished professor of law and public policy at the William H. Bowen School of Law, he is a William J. Clinton Distinguished Fellow here at the Clinton School, where he is working with us. And in fact, on Tuesday, May the 8th, uh, we'll occupy this podium uh, in a discussion uh, should the, or, or is claiming that U.S. attorneys should not serve at the pleasure of the President. Uh, as we all know, the U.S. Attorney issue, we've had Carl Rowe here, We've had Bud Cummings here, uh, and now Dean Pippa is going to talk about uh, should the U.S. Attorney serve at the pleasure of the President. Should be an interesting lecture and discussion. But more importantly, what you need to know about him is that he started his career as a legal services attorney, and he worked there from 1978, worked with legal services from 1978 to 1983. Uh, he's a great member of this faculty, a great legal scholar. Would you please welcome John Pippa? everyone's email correspondent. <laughs> and, and thank you for the kind introduction of all the things I've done in my life, and I apparently am very good at collecting titles. The thing I am most proud of was my service for five years, actually five and a half years, as a legal services attorney um, in a variety of capacities. It's the most fulfilling work, in my view, that a lawyer could do. And so when I saw that Elaine Barnett was on the program today, um, he was the first one I wanted to respond to this semester because this is truly where I think the heart of the profession lies. Helene Barnett was appointed president of the Legal Services Corporation in January 2004. The corporation provides funds for 138 legal aid programs and 700 offices in the country. Barnett received her Bachelor of Arts from Barnard College and her law degree from New York University School of Law. She has devoted her entire 37-year professional career to providing legal services for the indigent. Before assuming her LSC position, she was with the Legal Aid Society of New York City, which is the oldest and largest legal aid organization in the country. She spent three decades in management in the Legal Aid Society's multi-office, 240-person-strong civil division, 
which she headed from 1994 to the end of 2003. That alone should earn her a special place in heaven. Recently, she was recognized for developing and executing a disaster response plan to coordinate the delivery of legal services to New Yorkers in the aftermath of the September 11th attacks. As LSC president, Barnett has undertaken a revision of LSC's performance criteria, the issuance of a major report entitled Documenting the Justice Gap in America, a pilot loan repayment assistance program to assist LSC programs with recruitment and retention of high quality lawyers, and a pilot leadership mentoring program which will serve as a model for the development of future diverse legal services leaders. Barnett is the first legal services attorney to be appointed president of LSC, and she is the only legal services attorney to serve on the American Bar Association's Board of Governors and its executive committee. Please join me in welcoming Elaine Barnett. especially 
one devoted to serving low-income individuals who have nowhere else to turn, provides personal fulfillment and professional satisfaction for many reasons. Today I will focus on those that have been most important to me and share a few personal highlights. The pursuit of justice is as old as human history. The roots can be found in the Bible, as Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 20 says, Justice, justice shall you pursue, that you may thrive. The legal origins go back to the Magna Carta, which states to no one will be sell, no one will refuse or delay right or justice. The preamble to our own Constitution affirms that its central purpose is to establish justice. And since 1892, we have pledged allegiance to our flag with liberty and justice for all. Without doubt, equal justice is a bedrock legal principle for all Americans. The words equal justice under law are inscribed on the west pediment of the Supreme Court building in Washington and on courthouses throughout the country for good reason. As former United States Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell observed, Equal justice under law is not merely a caption on the facade of the Supreme Court building. It is perhaps the most inspiring ideal of our society. It is fundamental that justice should be the same in substance and availability without regard to economic status. What distinguishes our system of government in large part is the separation of powers the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government. Having an independent judiciary ensures adherence to the rule of law. Our judicial system protects individual rights and makes fundamental determinations relating to life, liberty, and property. But the rights and protections embedded in our laws are not self-enforcing. Individuals must often secure or defend their rights using legal claims and defenses and interacting with the Courts. This is easier said than done. The procedures of our legal system are complicated. The language of our laws is often opaque, frequently impenetrable, and subject to multiple meanings and interpretations. The specialized skills of a lawyer are almost always necessary to navigate the complexities of our legal system. But lawyers <coughs> cost money. Money people living in poverty do not have. Consequently, they frequently do not have lawyers, even when they desperately need them. The poor are assured counsel in criminal cases by the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution, as confirmed by the United States Supreme Court in 1963 in Gideon versus Wainwright. But that guarantee has not yet been extended to civil cases. As one commentator widely observed, it is unacceptable in a civilized society that the only time a poor person can get into court with a lawyer is when he or she commits a crime. The issues for which the poor seek legal address in civil matters are for essential human needs. Often they threaten not just the economic and personal survival of an individual, but the fabric of society as a whole. Civil legal aid cases involve the most vulnerable among us. Women seeking protection from abuse. Mothers trying to obtain child support. Families facing foreclosure and homelessness. Veterans who have been denied health and disability benefits. Elderly people who have been exploited by predatory lenders. Legal aid lawyers help improve the lives of low-income persons by helping them secure basic necessities such as safe and habitable housing, food, necessary health care, the keys to stability and self-sufficiency. By doing so, not only do they make a meaningful difference in an individual life, but they benefit society as a whole. To illustrate what this can mean, I'd like to share with you two examples from my own experience as a legal aid lawyer. The first involves the desperate plight of homeless families with children. When I was with the Legal Aid Society of New York City, we learned that 200 families were being housed in a barrack-style gymnasium. 
I will always remember the first time I visited my colleagues at midnight on a cold winter night. There were no partitions, just rows of cots. There was no place to put personal belongings, just plastic garbage bags. There was a communal bathroom, and it was filthy. Other homeless families with children were living in welfare hotels in Times Square, for which the city was paying $100 a room a night, quite a high rate at that time. A family with three children was housed in a small room with two single beds, no refrigerator for food, and a bathroom down the hall, and to get to it, the children had to walk past drug users. Still others stayed overnight in a welfare office, sleeping on tables, chairs up or on the floor, with glaring fluorescent lights burning all night long, preventing the children from sleeping. As a result of a significant private grant, I created the Homeless Family Rights Project and assumed direct responsibility for providing advocates for homeless families with children and responding to their individual needs, families that included newborn children, families that included pregnant women, that had children with asthma and other medical problems. The work of the project st staff obtained appropriate emergency housing placements. And over a number of years, through the work of the project, the barrack-style shelters were closed, placement of homeless families in substandard rooms in welfare hotels was disallowed, and emergency housing for homeless families provided by the city and state was required to meet minimum standards of sanitation, safety, and decency. The second example I would like to share with you is the response of New York City's legal aid lawyers to the tragedy of 9-11. Our office was across the street from the World Trade Center. Although airplane parts fell on our roof, thankfully the entire staff escaped without injury. But we could not return to our building, had no access to our offices or files, and had to relocate to our largest trial office in Brooklyn. As thousands fled the area around the World Trade Center, legal aid lawyers returned to Lower Manhattan to staff the city's newly opened disaster centers seven days a week for more than 10 months. We established a disaster hotline to expedite referrals to neighborhood offices throughout the city. We stationed legal aid lawyers at social service agencies, healthcare centers, union offices. Legal aid lawyers also prepared disaster assistance guides, and we worked with the state government to help create an emergency Medicaid program for disaster victims. One by one, we helped 8,500 individuals, people who had lost family members, people who, as a result of the attacks, found themselves suddenly out of work lacking health insurance, facing consumer credit problems, on the verge of eviction or foreclosure. These people lived and worked in Lower Manhattan. They worked in restaurants, hotels, maintaining buildings, making deliveries, conducting tours. Some owned and operated small shops. It was, in my opinion, a shining hour for New York City's legal aid lawyers, paralegals, and advocates. I have never been more proud to be among them, of the work we do, the difference we make in individual lives, than I was during the aftermath of 9-11, helping the victims of that disaster rebuild their shattered lives. Nearly three and a half years ago, I was afforded the incredible opportunity and privilege to work on the national level to try to ensure equal access to justice to low-income individuals in civil cases. Let me now share with you some specifics about the organization I serve as president, the Legal Services Corporation. Congress entrusts LSC with a dual mission, to promote equal access to justice in our nation and to provide high-quality civil legal assistance to low-income Americans. LSC is governed by a bipartisan board of directors with 11 members. The board is appointed by the President of the United States with the advice and consent of the Senate. And John Ann Childs of Little Rock, who is with us today, is a member of the board. The board appointed me as president in January 2004. Three out of four of our clients, LSE-funded programs, are women. 
Many of you are mothers struggling to keep their families together and their children safe, fed, and housed. They are all races and ethnicities, young and old, the working poor, people with disabilities, single parents, veterans, victims of domestic violence, victims of natural disasters, Native Americans on reservations, migrant farm workers. Our clients are the most marginalized and vulnerable individuals among us. Here in Arkansas, more than 25% of the population lives in poverty in nine Delta counties. Six of those same counties are among the 10 poorest counties in the United States. Nationwide, more than 50 million Americans live in poverty. Alarmingly, that includes 13 million children, one in five. These are the people who are eligible to receive help from LSE-funded programs. In Arkansas and our nation as a whole, their numbers are growing and resources are not keeping pace. In October 2005, LSE issued a groundbreaking report documenting the justice gap in America, the current unmet civil, civil legal needs of low-income Americans. It was the first nationwide comprehensive analysis of the number of people that LSE-funded programs are unable to serve due to lack of resources. LSE-funded programs recorded the number of eligible people who actually came to their offices that they could not serve. On average, for every person served, one was turned away. Just 50% of those who actually sought help received it. This is consistent with the findings of the Arkansas Access to Justice Commission, which reports that more than half of 27,000 individuals seeking legal civil legal aid in 2005 did not receive help due to lack of resources. The people our programs turn away have nowhere else to turn to. They cannot afford to hire lawyers. And in effect, they are denied access to justice. Each year, a million or more people who seek help from LSE-funded programs and are eligible to receive it and fall within the priorities our offices set in meeting those needs are turned away for one primary reason, lack of resources. If anything, the Justice Gap Report understated the unmet need for civil legal aid. Many who are eligible for help never seek it. They don't know they have a legal problem. They don't know help is available or don't know where to go for help. Moreover, the Justice Gap Report was completed before Hurricane Katrina simultaneously swelled the need for civil legal aid and the number of people without access to it. Like the victims of 9-11, but on a much larger scale, many victims of Hurricane Katrina faced more than one pressing legal issue at the same time. Rent gouging by unscrupulous landlords, issues with temporary housing and mobile homes, disputes over home repairs, consumer fraud associated with everything from small appliances to insurance problems, health problems caused by cleanup activities, and increased child abuse and domestic violence associated with disaster-related stress. While LSE-funded offices have rendered extraordinary services, over 18 months later, thousands of cases are still unresolved. I know from my own experience with the aftermath of 9-11 that we can expect Katrina-related cases to continue for many years to come. Since the release of the Justice Gap Report, Hurricane Katrina not only increased the need as well as the number of people to receive it, but additional state legal need studies conducted in the last year have found that the unmet need ranges from 68% in parts of Tennessee to 92% in West Virginia, and that 99% of defendants in eviction cases in New Jersey and in Washington, D.C. go to court without a lawyer. The most recent legal need studies in Utah and Wisconsin document an unmet need of 80% or more, which is consistent with findings from other states. 
In addition to closing the justice gap, a primary emphasis during my tenure at LSC and a personal priority has been enhancing the quality of legal services provided by LSC funding programs. Access to a lawyer is not, in and of itself, access to justice. We must also ensure that LSC funded programs provide legal services of the highest possible quality. By making quality focus, I am not implying that LSC funded programs do not provide high quality services. Indeed, in my experience, they provide representation of the very highest quality, despite resource constraints. But there is always room for improvement. By putting quality at the forefront of what LSC stands for today, I hope to send a message that we can continually strive to do better. Last year, for example, we revised LSC's performance criteria, originally written in the early 1990s. The centerpiece of our quality agenda, they embodied the legal services community's collective wisdom on best practices and set the standards for quality. LSC uses the performance criteria as a framework to evaluate programs and grant applications and to challenge programs to engage in self-evaluations to improve their services. Another key element is our pilot loan payment assistance program to encourage recent law school graduates to make legal services a career, to encourage those who have chosen this career to remain in the field, and to serve as a model to spur development of more such programs. On average, participants in LSC's loan assistance repayment program graduated from law school with $70,000 in debt and earned just $32,000 in their first year as a legal aid attorney. Another element of our quality agenda is the Leadership Mentoring Pilot Program, developed by LSC, the National Legal Aid Defender Association, and the Management Information Exchange. Through this program, we hope to develop a model that will identify, nurture, and support a diverse group of well-trained future leaders for the legal services community as a whole. Our quality agenda also includes technology grants, to expand, to expand access to legal information and to increase program efficiency and effectiveness. LSE has, for example, to support the development of statewide legal services websites to provide information and referrals for residents of all 50 states. We have also supported development of web-based tools enabling pro bono lawyers and pro se litigants to create more than 70,000 legal documents for use in court. This year, LSE launched a major initiative to enhance pro bono partnerships between LSE-funded programs and the private bar. The theme of our action plan is help close the justice gap, unleash the power of pro bono. Through this plan, we hope to highlight the potential, the opportunities, and the challenges of private attorney involvement, and identify ways to encourage, enhance, and increase the effectiveness with LSE programs. But meaningful as these efforts are, LSE cannot fully realize its mission as long as the justice gap in which endures. To narrow it, we need a multi-pronged effort to secure more resources for both the public and private sectors. In this effort, government must lead the way, consistent with its role in maintaining the formal justice system, providing an orderly forum for the resolution of disputes, and providing an avenue for equal justice for all. This year, for the first time in four years, LSC received a, budget, a modest budget increase of $22 million, bringing our total appropriation up to $348 million, which is our largest congressional appropriation since 1995. Although securing further increases will be a challenge, LSC is fortunate to have bipartisan support, and I am hopeful that since providing civil legal aid to the poor is essential to the principles that are the linchpin of our democracy, that our needs will be better met. Before I conclude, I'd like to share with you a final story of a different type. It is perhaps the most important thing I have ever done, and that is to salvage a life. 
When I created the Homeless Family Rights Project in New York City, I advertised for a community advocate, someone to go to the shelters, interact with homeless families and children, and educate them about their legal rights and the services available to them. I received an application from someone in prison, a repeat felony offender on drug-related charges. He asked to be considered for the job as he was about to be released, saying he wanted to convince poor children not to follow his path. I met with him when he was released from prison and found there was something very special about him. He had a genuine desire to make a difference. He wanted to help our clients avoid the mistakes that he had made in his own life. Despite my initial reservations, I was convinced of his sincerity. I decided he was worth taking a chance on, and I offered him the job. He became our most outstanding paralegal, working seven days a week for five years. He had a strong work ethic, deeply held principles, a great ability to communicate, and acquired substantial knowledge of legal rights and services for homeless families. After five years, he came to me and said he would like to go to law school at night and continue to his work with homeless families during the day. He was accepted to Fordham Law School, graduated order of the Bob. Upon graduation, he was offered and accepted a federal district court clerkship. He took the New York bar exam and passed it. And then his troubles began. New York's first judicial department, where he lived, denies admission to the bar to anyone who has a felony conviction. I told him I would take his case personally and argue to the highest course if necessary that there could not be a per se bar for someone with such a demonstrated record of rehabilitation. It was recommended that he move to a different part of the state where it might be easier to get admitted to the bar. He responded that he would stay in his home where he had always lived with his family. That is where his neighbors were. That is where his friends were. That is where the priests that knew him best were. He was not willing to move simply to increase his chances of getting a little bit more. To make a long story short, after substantial work and extensively documenting every aspect of his life, in preparation for a court hearing, he was interviewed by the Character and Fitness Committee, and for the first time, the committee recommended admission to the bar. After his clerkship, he continued in public service, working as the director of a program for ex offenders <coughs> Frankly, one of the most rewarding aspects of my work has been the opportunity to give him and others, assistance at critical points in their lives, to help them gain access to justice. In doing so, I have only helped them to realize their own fullest potential. And that for me is perhaps the most fulfilling aspect of public service work. In conclusion, I have spent my career trying to secure access to justice for low-income Americans. I've had remarkable experiences as a legal aid lawyer involved in major initiatives that affected large numbers of people, cases that involved a single individual, and had the opportunity to hire and work with the most talented, dedicated, and special colleagues. And today I'm privileged to lead an organization whose mission is to fulfill our nation's promise of equal access to justice for all. Therefore, I encourage the students among us, in considering a career in public service, to consider one that involves securing access for low-income Americans. It may not be as financially rewarding as other paths, but I hope, as I have conveyed to you today, it is deeply satisfying and rewarding in many other ways. In his first inaugural address, our third president, Thomas Jefferson, listed the essential principles of our government. First among them was equal and exact justice for all. Of particular significance to where we are today, 
at LSE's 25th anniversary celebration, our 42nd president, William Jefferson Clinton, affirmed that principle. He described equal justice as the birthright of every American and said the rights that are enunciated in the law books and in the Supreme Court cases should be real in the lives of all Americans. When I reflect on what motivated me to be a legal aid lawyer so many years ago and remain in this endeavor for so long, it is my belief that providing civil legal services to the poor is central to fundamental fairness, due process, and equal protection under law. It is also how the use of the law may be used to correct inequities and abuses and to secure and protect the rights of the disenfranchised and vulnerable among us. For ultimately, how we respond to the needs of the most vulnerable among us at their time of greatest need is clearly one of the ways in which we will be judged to be a civilized society. Our nation promises justice for all, not just for those who can afford to pay for it. The ideal may never be realized fully, but America can come closer to it. It is required of all of us, in the legal community, in the government, in the judiciary, in the law schools, in the business community, in the faith-based community, and the community at large, to keep working to make the principle a reality. As Judge Learned Hand aptly noted, if we are to keep our democracy, there must be one commandment, thou shalt not ration justice. Thank you. 
difficult it has been over the years to recruit qualified personnel to affect the program that you wish to serve. Thank you for asking that question. I have always been amazed that regardless of the low salaries that legal services programs pay, we have been able to attract, and I can say personally, been able to attract um, the brightest and the best of law students. We have never had a dirt of them. However, I think faced with huge law school debt today, um, many who would like to come to us simply can't afford to come to us given the substantial debt. And that's why I mentioned that loan payment assistance programs, uh, not just ours, which is quite limited, there's a movement in Congress uh, for bills to uh, ensure uh, loan payment assistance are so critically important. But in spite of that, I, I have never found that the <coughs> services programs have not nonetheless been able to attract uh, first class law students to the programs. Um, in your over other programs throughout the state or the nation, um, how do you measure the need of the limited English proficiency uh, eligible clients that you have? How do those programs implemented and what do you do if those need to come out? We actually have a program letter that gives guidance to LSE funded programs of uh, how to uh, reach out to individuals seeking services with limited English proficiency. And it talks in terms of having um, a staff that can speak multiple languages, having the availability of interpreters. Um, we don't collect data specifically on the number of clients, but all our programs uh, have the guidance how to reach out to communities to know uh, what the uh, community represents in terms of uh, potential applicants with limited English proficiency.
citizen to be eligible for LSD services. Undocumented immigrants uh, are uh, do have access to services through your organization. Uh, there are certain restrictions imposed by Congress on the work that LSD can do and on its eligible clients. <laughs> and no, we cannot represent generally undocumented aliens, but there are three exceptions. Uh, if they're victims of domestic violence, they're victims of human trafficking, and if they come into this country on an H2A visa, which is working, and the legal issue arises during the course of their employment in this country, we can represent them. But otherwise, we cannot. We have time for one or two more questions. Organization to buy poverty, you say you represent the board of our rights and our standards. The standard is 125% of the federally defined level of poverty, which is set by the Department of Human Services annually. So they have just come out, we go 125%, and the one that I remember most easily is a family for it. It's just about 25. Thank you. Uh, let's join us again. We welcome.